So while we can't get identification if we don't make any assumptions about the parametric form of the structural equations, we can fairly easily show that we can get identification if we have that the structural equation for the outcome y is linear. So we'll use that linear setting as a warm up now. If we make this assumption that the outcome is a linear function of t and the unobserved confounder u, then we can get identification. So this is a fourth assumption, and unlike the three assumptions before, this assumption is about parametric form. And importantly, in this structural equation, z doesn't appear. That's because of the exclusion restriction assumption. z isn't a parent of y, so it's not part of the causal mechanism that generates y, and this causal mechanism here we're assuming is linear in this slide. That's the assumption we're introducing in this slide. We'll start in the setting where z and t are binary, and because our goal is to identify the causal effect of t on y, and because we know that this instrument z is supposed to be useful somehow, we'll start with this quantity, the expected value of y given z equals 1, minus the expected value of y given z equals 0. So we're starting with this associational difference, and we're going to use it to show that we can identify the causal effect of t on y which in this case is just delta because that is the scalar in front of t in the linear structural equation that generates y. You can see that structural equation in the bottom right corner of the screen. And the very first thing we're going to do is just plug that structural equation in for y. So that's what we get here. To do this, we're using the linear outcome assumption. And in addition, we're using the exclusion restriction assumption since that tells us that z doesn't show up in this structural equation for y. Then we can just use linearative expectation and regroup terms so that we have the delta terms grouped on the left and the alpha sub u terms grouped on the right. Then in these conditional expectations for u, we can get rid of z because u and z are independent due to the instrumental unconfoundedness assumption. You can see this independence in the causal graph in the bottom right here as u to t to z, that path is blocked by the collider t, and similarly any other path, so the other path from u to z would be u to y to t to z, is blocked by the collider y. So because of that independence between u and z, we could just remove the z that was behind the conditioning bar in the conditional expectation for u. Then expected value of u minus expected value of u is zero, so we can just remove that term. And finally, we can solve for delta by just dividing both sides by this factor here to get this equation. The right-hand side is purely statistical, as there's no potential outcomes or do operators. So you know that we've identified the causal effect delta which in the linear setting is the average treatment effect and it's the individual treatment effect for every individual as well. But there's one more thing, which is what if the denominator is zero? Then we would have something that's undefined. And that's what the one assumption that we haven't used yet gives us. That's the relevance assumption. That was the very first one that we saw. That assumption tells us that this denominator must be non-zero. So using all of those four assumptions, we've identified delta. The linear setting can give us some useful intuition for instrumental variables, as the causal association that flows along a directed path in linear setting is just the product of coefficients along that path, where the coefficients on these edges denote the coefficients that are in front of the parent on the edge in the structural equation that generates the child. So delta is in front of t in the structural equation for y, and alpha z is in front of z in the structural equation for t. Okay, so we're going to multiply some coefficients along these paths and show how that gives us intuition for instrumental variables. So the first is to look at the numerator of this identifying equation for delta here. In the numerator, we have the causal effect of z on y, so we can see that graphically as this z to t to y path. To get that, we multiply the alpha sub z coefficient times delta, and we just put that in for the numerator. 
And then similarly, the denominator is the causal effect of z on t. So we do that by just looking at the edge from z to t. Because this path consists of just one edge, this causal effect of z on t in the denominator just turns into that coefficient on just that edge. And then we can see that the alpha sub z's cancel out to give us delta. So the way we're identifying the causal effect here is we're first identifying the causal effect of z on y, which we can be get because there's no confounding of the effect of z on y. There's no backdoor path from z to y. And then we're identifying the causal effect of z on t here. And then we're just dividing that. So we're just getting this path and then canceling out this part to leave us with the effect of t on y. All right, so that's some useful intuition. How do we actually estimate this quantity? This specific estimand on the right-hand side is known as the walled estimand. And because this estimand consists of just four different expectations, the walled estimator is easy enough. To estimate the expected value of y given z equals 1, we just look at all of the samples where z equals 1, and then we average over them. So we just average over y, and n1 is the number of examples where z equals 1. Then we do the same for the other conditional expectations. n0 here is the number of samples where z equals 0. And in the denominator, we're just doing the same thing for t, since it's an expectation over t. So we just saw how to identify the causal effect of t on y using the instrument z in the binary setting where z and t are binary. But what if t and z are continuous? Can we still identify the causal effect of t on y in that setting? Yeah, if the structural equation for y is still linear, then we can identify the causal effect. It ends up just being the covariance of y and z divided by the covariance of t and z. So I put these two estimands next to each other. On the left-hand side, there's the one in the binary setting. On the right-hand side, there's the one in the continuous setting. I put these next to each other because they're very similar. You might think of the one on the right as the continuous analog of the one on the left. And we'll now actually derive the one on the right. Just as in the binary setting, z and y are kind of special. As z is the instrument that we want to use for identification, and y is the outcome that we're interested in for measuring the causal effect of t on. So it seems like something useful that we might want to start with is the covariance of y and z. The first step we'll use is apply a basic covariance identity. You can look this up on Wikipedia if this looks unfamiliar. Then we just plug in the structural equation for y, just as we did last time. Here we're using the linear outcome assumption and the exclusion restriction assumption, same as last time in the binary setting. You'll see that many of the steps in this proof parallel the ones in the binary setting. Then if we just distribute terms and apply linearity of expectation, we get this. And then we can rearrange terms to bring the delta terms together and the alpha terms together. This allows us to easily see that we can now apply the same covariance identity that we used in the very first step. We can now apply that twice here to get the covariance of t and z and the covariance of u and z. Then u and z are independent by the instrumental unconfoundedness assumption, so that covariance is zero, so we can remove that term. And finally, we can just solve for delta where the denominator here is non-zero due to the relevance assumption, so this is not undefined. So we've identified the causal effect of t on y in the setting where z and t are continuous now. Then we can use this estimand for estimation by just plugging in estimates of each of these covariances. That gives us an estimate for delta. This is analogous to the walled estimator. But another estimator that we could use here, which is more useful for giving us intuition about why instruments work, and which happens to also be a very popular estimator, is known as the two-stage least squares estimator. So what does that estimator look like? It's two stages. The first is that we linearly regress t on z to estimate the conditional expectation of t given z. 
This gives us a projection of t onto z, which we'll label as t hat. It's the best predictions in the mean squared error sense that we can get for t, given that we are using z as input. And then we'll use that t hat in the second stage, where we linearly regress y on t hat to estimate the conditional expectation y given t hat. And our estimate for delta will be the fitted coefficient in front of t hat in that linear regression. So here's the intuition that I mentioned this estimator is useful for. Consider this graph in the bottom here, and consider that t hat equals the estimated expectation of t given z. Imagine that we change this graph. So instead of using t, we're going to use t hat. Right, so in stage two of the estimator, we're not regressing y on t, we're regressing y on t hat. And then note that t hat is only a function of z, it's not also a function of u, like t is. So because t hat isn't a function of u, we can remove this edge from u to t hat. And that shows you why if we use t hat instead of t, we remove confounding here. Right, there's no unobserved confounding from t hat to y. There's no backdoor paths from t hat to y. That's because we kind of removed that unobserved confounding when we projected t onto z to get t hat in stage one, which we then used in stage two to regress y onto t hat. And this two stage least squares estimator is really popular. You can also use it in the binary setting. Z and T don't have to be continuous to use it. And that's the end of this section. Here's the proof that we saw in the binary setting again. And the question here is where do we use each of the four assumptions in the proof below? Then the next question is for the continuous linear setting. In the continuous linear setting, prove that delta is equal to the covariance of y and z divided by the covariance of t and z.